Um, uh, I'm not going to finish. So I'm, okay, I'm just going to keep steaming ahead until they pull the plug on me. <laughs> okay, so essentially what we've got with identification of the aggressor is where a terrifying experience threatens to completely overwhelm the person, it has to be pushed out of consciousness. That's our psychodynamic 101. Um, the case, this is done by repressing awareness of the experience of being overwhelmed by the victim. And this is the interesting process here. Uh, uh, of negating one's own experience and instead imaginatively putting oneself in the position of the aggressor. So instead of knowing your own experience, that experience has gotten rid of and the experience of the aggressor is kind of sucked in. That, that's what forensic means by interjected. It kind of becomes your own experience because imagining the world from the position of the aggressor is, is actually much safer. Um, so we t I say they're psychologically freeing from the experience of the victim and instead taking refuge in the perspective of the perpetrator. And one of the advantages of this is the emotional connection with the perpetrator can be su sustained because often the perpetrator is also the, 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 the person who provides all other kinds of life support there. And it avoids feelings of helplessness, vulnerability and abandonment. So what we're dealing with there is... Um, oh dear... Um, is this idea that, um, that that is almost like a shift in consciousness, jumping out of one's own consciousness into the consciousness of the perpetrator. This allows the underlying feelings of vulnerability and fear to be managed and instead to place one imaginatively in a controlling position. Um, when this happens, it, it then leads to other threats to the self being dealt with by violence and the reassertion of a kind of perpetrator position. At the same time, um, it also leads to another psychodynamic process of displacement where the, where the kind of rage that couldn't be safely expressed towards a perpetrator get, instead gets displaced onto other target groups, particularly kind of social out groups, criminals, foreigners, other ethnicities, other sexual orientations. Um, and what interests me also, and I think this is a lot more work needs to be done on this, this, this psychodynamic process leads to the idealization of social and political leaders who embody um, forcefulness and violence. So, 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 so this theory, and somewhere else I'll explain why this leads to people like Malema being supported precisely because of his mobilization of a rhetoric of violence. It's not an accident, it's a deeply linked mechanism. Okay. And that's a good place to start. <laughs> Is it? Or should I finish my conclusion slide? Uh, <laughs> test out the wait until you're in the chair. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to, two minutes. One minute. One minute. Okay, so, <laughs> so essentially where I'm, where, where I'm going with this huge rush is that people want to avoid victimization, but they want to hold on to violence as a resource. Okay, and I think that's a very important distinction to make. That violence provides a range of strategies for managing social and interpersonal and psychological problems. That the pro one of the, 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 the dangers of this is these strategies are ultimately ineffective because they place the users of those strategies in violence them in, in, in situations of danger themselves. And they're equally undesirable because they increase the overall levels of violence in society and create these kind of self perpetuating systems of violence. And that they are also, and, and this interests me a lot, and I'm talking about this in the book, that they're incompatible with, with democracy because the use of violence as a problem-solving resource is the antithesis of the use of negotiation towards uh, consensually achieving collective social goods. Okay, so um, that's it. That's me then. Um, Leon is from government, Department of Social Development. No. Oh, no, he's not. Sorry. Please, I've left, I've left government a few, a few years ago. It's not bad income government. Here we go. Cheers. We're talking about a space for practitioners, academics, etc., policymakers. Actually, I cut my teeth in, in Leon. <laughs> actually cut my teeth in government. I used to work for the Department of Correctional Services many, many years ago as a, um, as a correctional social worker. Um, and I had the, I don't know, should you call it a privilege of working, of leaving varsity and starting to work at a very young age of something like 21 or 22 guy, I can't remember, with some of the um, most serious offenders in South Africa in a, in a super maximum prison in Johannesburg. Yes. 
And I think it was this experience that have kind of put me on this pathway of trying to understand violence and trying to understand, <laughs> because I think most of us in the room will agree that um, all the theories that we've, that we've been taught, doesn't matter where we come from, our disciplines, our backgrounds, the history of our theories, I found this so interesting. When you, when you sit down face to face with a serial, a serial predator, with 25 that's murdered, 20, violently murdered 25 people, those theories tend to go south very quickly. Mm. And, you'd, and I think that was one of my biggest challenges as, as trying to understand who are we dealing with here and how did this person get to this point in their lives? Right, and then of course then you go and you, and you look at all your psychodynamic theories and you go, mm, that doesn't work and you throw it out and then you try your, your social learning theories and you go, yeah, it kind of explains some of what we're looking at but also not too much and whoop, there goes the social dynamic theories and then you go and you say, well, maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe they were, they were born this way. They, this is a genetic predisposition and, 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 and some people have a propensity for violence because of the way that, you know, their ancestors engaged and for 4.6 billion years we've evolved to this point of being violent, a violent society that create violent people, right? And then of course, if you go look at the latest research, we've now identified four mutations on the... <laughs> Cheers. We've, we've identified four mutations, um, gene, genetic mutations, that's associated strongly with, with violent perpetrators. Um, so, but anyways, that's just the background to why I'm so interested in this field. Um, so, in, in my time working in prison, trying to understand what, is, what are we working with here, I came across the work of Lonnie Athens. Now, some crim Lonnie Athens is a criminologist, um, the criminologists in the room might know him. But his work fascinated me because he, he offered some explanation that kind of fit in with some of my own understanding of what am I dealing with here. So I, so I contacted Lonnie and I emailed him, said to him, Lonnie, please, you know, you need to give me <laughs> access to your theory and that. And he very, he very nicely did that. He sent me his stuff and he engaged with me over time. Right, so I'm not going to spend time talking about stats, colleagues. I think we are inundated by statistics. Um, our colleague from government this morning cited some horrendous and horrific statistics that we are aware of um, every day. And it's, and it's interesting how we, how we insulate ourselves from those statistics. If I listen to your talk through this perception that maybe violence is an acceptable way of dealing um, with what we see in our country. Right, so, but what do we know? What do we actually know? Um, well, we know a lot, but we also don't know a lot. Okay, so I've, I'm looking at it from, and I'm, I'm using, I'm borrowing the, a little bit of the trauma lens to look at um, violentization. So we know from our clinical research and, and practice that many children are exposed, and, and you've alluded to this, there's this, this idea out there that, and it's been proven, I'll, I'll cite some of the research just now, that children are, ex children are exposed to trauma and abuse, right? We know that, but I think what is interesting <coughs> is this concept of polyvictimization polyvictimization, where it's multiple forms of trauma over their lives. It's not one form of abuse only. It's not just um, abuse that we see in the, in, in the family or um, in, 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 in our communities. It's multiple forms of abuse. So the same child might be sexually abused or physically abused or bullied by peers when they get to school. <coughs> Um, they might even witness neighborhood violence and their own, per their own parents might be engaged in um, interpersonal violence. So it's multiple forms of abuse that leads to a syndrome that's called polyvictimization. Right, so what is polyvictimization? Well, it's a form of trauma. I found it very interesting that so many of us will be using the lens of trauma over the next two days to try and engage with, with, with this very difficult topic. So what is trauma? Trauma is a life-threatening or a psychologically devastating event, right? That leads to a few things, and it's important for us to, to, to kind of just take a moment and look at those, <coughs> ev at those effects, right? The person's capacities to cope are overwhelmed, right? And, 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 and we've heard some of this and I found it very interesting, the, 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 the whole notion of the Stockholm Syndrome and of domestic violence, that <coughs> the person's own sense of efficacy and agency gets overwhelmed by, that, by, by the violence or the trauma. As a result, the, there's changes in the brain circuitry, and we know this, the brain basically rewires itself. It rewires itself, 
Okay, and this leads to significant dysregulation dysregula in thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Right, so that's kind of um, trauma 101. So, this, so there is research out there that says that abuse <coughs> children suffer from long-term <coughs> cognitive and social dysfunctions when they're exposed to trauma at an early age. Often, these children who live through abuse grow up to become abusers themselves, creating a cycle of violence and abuse. So, so that there is some empirical evidence out there. Um, and a lot of this work has been done in South Africa as well. Right, so this morning our, um, we heard that we need to start integrating um, our ideas and our concepts. And what I find always very interesting is how we, we either talk about the offender or we talk about the victim. But very rarely do we, do we integrate <coughs> those two, right? And I'm not saying that that's what I'm trying to do today, but it's, I think we need to start thinking about um, um, and, 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 and this, this concept that the criminal justice system um, um, is, it sh maybe shouldn't be unified. We should. We should unify the criminal justice system. And the way to unify that is by looking at both the perpetrator and the victim at the same time and, and stop having these institutions that, well, I'm only working with the victim or I'm only working with the perpetrator, right? Because we see the same kind of experiences, polyvictimization that leads to dysregulation that leads to a sense of search for coping strategies, right, over time. Human agency, we all have free will and choice, and the outcome is one of three things. And I know it's not as the, the social scientists in the room are gonna say, Leon, things are never as clear cut as that. You know, there's always permutations, there's never as, but anyway, so briefly, maybe uh, even through all of those experiences, the child chooses a pro-social way of dealing with the trauma, or the child chooses, chooses an antisocial way of dealing with the trauma, or the child becomes self-destructive, right? Meaning the, the, the child, start, we start seeing deliberate self-harm, etc. We start seeing things like 13-year-olds, um, 9-year-olds um, falling pregnant, um, um, self-destructive behavior, um, using of, of, of drugs, substance, etc. So, so and, and there we see a huge amount of vulnerability. We see vulnerability that's there that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with both the victim and the perpetrator. So, all right, let's link that to Athens, okay, and his violent socialization theory. So Athens borrowed a little bit from um, the social sciences and the social learning theory, and he says that people are a result, you and I, we are a result of the social experiences that we have undergone in our lives. Now, most of these social experiences just go past like a stream, an endless stream, right? But some, and they are quickly over and they're easily forgotten. But some of them are so significant and consequential that they will have a lifelong effect on the life of the person. So let me quickly tell you a story whilst I'm here. Okay, I don't know, can you see my son? Can you see him there? All right, that's my, sorry, there's some. This is my son, Christian, okay? Christian is eight years old. And Christian have had many, many, many haircuts over his life. But on Monday, dad took him for a haircut and I failed as a parent because I, I, I left him with the barber. I explained to the barber, please use a number four, just kind of top and tail, etc. I went to the pharmacy to have a script filled. When I came back, Christian had a brush cut. All his hair was gone. He was in tears. He was traumatized. He got home. He said to me, dad, I hate this. I hate the way I look. And I said to him, buddy, it's only hair. It's only here, it's gonna grow back. I'm not telling you the story to explain to you how not to be a parent <laughs> and how to fail, how failing your seven-year-old son. I think I'm using this story to explain this concept of, of, of um, socialization, that he's had many haircuts, it goes past us, but it's those, it's those episodes that lead to, that's memorable, that stays in the, in, 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 in the mind of the child over time that we need to be aware of. So he developed this conceptual model, okay, and I was interested in, will it work in South Africa? So he came up, his model has, it's got, fo it's got four stages. It's a, he's a stage theorist, so once again, the critical analysts in the room will say, life is never just a logical flow or a stage, right? But anyways, he has this, it's called brutalization, defines violent performance and virulency. So he's looking at four things that happen. So, he's, so his whole theory is that children go through exposures of violence over time, right? And the first stage is <coughs> called brutalization. 
This involves teaching the child and demonstrating violent behavior, which includes threat, threatening the child, use of physical force, and even observing the, where the child observes or is aware of um, the person using physical force to cope with everyday life and to cope with social situations. So inside of this brutalization, there's three distinct stages or experiences. The first one is violent subjugation, where the child is violently subjugated by one or both of the, of the parents, right, or the guardians, okay? And, he, and, and, and where the, ch the parent will use, will use violence, or, uh, or as it is known in South Africa, corrective discipline, to help the child to learn how to behave and how to, you know, how to um, um, listen and be obedient to the parent. The result, of course, is a battered and suffocated child. The second one, which is an interesting one, is personal horrification, which I think, and this one, if, we, if, if the chair allows me time, is for me the crucial one, is where the child e experience or witness somebody else that's significant to the child it being ex exposed to violent subjugation. Um, and, and where the child feels that they can't do anything about it, right? Although this might not be physically as damaging, the psychological result of it is much more long-lasting on the child. And then, of course, the last one, which South Africans, I think we do very well, is called violent coaching, where we teach the child, we coach the child through a variety of techniques on how to be tough, how to toughen up. Boys don't cry. This is my boy, this is how you deal with, if this happens, this is how you deal with it, right? This is how you do, you smack his head off or something like that, right? Where we use, where we use this and, and we use this almost coaching the child how to resolve his or her problems. Right, then this leads us to the second stage, which is define, defines where the child then says, I want to stop this, but can I stop it, right? And then the child grows up where he says, if I'm provoked, if somebody says something to me, or if some, somebody, I'm gonna use this template that I've been taught, and I'm gonna react to this. But he always asks the question, can I get away with it? Which leads us to the third stage, which is then called violent, uh, violent performances, where the child makes a conscious decision to actually hurt somebody else, um, and they wait for that major provocation. I'm just waiting for somebody, and then it's like a trigger, and I'll just, it, it will just activate this choice to use violence. Interestingly enough, hazing and bullying is, is, is allowed and is an acceptable way for testing out um, 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 these behaviors at school and in our, in, our, in our own experiences. Then the last stage is virulency. This is where the child or the young person is now, is now recognized in his or her community as being a violent person. Now I know from our work with probation officers and um, forensic <coughs> social workers that the police will say to you, that boy that 16-year-old or that 15-year-old, we don't go near, we, we won't go there because he's killed five people. A 16-year-old, he's, he's, he's become known for violence. He's become notorious in his community. Um, and where people talk about him, the social trepidation, where people start, they treat him differently, right, because of his, his being so notorious, right? And he actually s develops the sense of malice where there's a desire to use violence to harm others. And other work that we're involved in with, with, with other colleagues, we're looking at um, this whole concept that violence is actually pleasurable. It's appetitive, right? And the, and the, 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 the stimulation that you get through the use of, of violence is actually part of what perpetuates violence in our communities. Great. So I'm not gonna spend time there because I see my chair is itching to start pushing the button. So we researched this, so that's the whole thing. Now let's see if it is true, is this? And so of course, I went in thinking I'm gonna get high levels of all of this stuff, high levels of exposure. So we tested it with 70 male respondents. We used um, the violent socialization scale, which is Lonnie Athens, where they took his, his theory and they put it into a scale and it's got 59 items which test those areas that I've just explained to you, right? So this is just for the scientists in the room. Is it reliable, Leon? Yes, very high reliability or internal reliability when we did a Kronbach, except for the last, for violent performances. Sorry, am I standing in your way? Except for violent performances, which is, as you remember, the third stage. Very low reliability, so I had to exclude it from the results and rerun the data analysis again. Okay, but you can see very high reliability. Okay, so meaning, we, what we see is kind of like reliable, okay? So here we go, first one. 
five minutes. I will be through this in five minutes. So here's the first scale, violent socialization, remember, what this is about, where the child is subjugated, where the child um, 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 is, where force of violence is used. Note, medium exposure. So when we interviewed these um, 78 young people, and we asked them, and we asked them in a Likert scale, on a scale from one to six, how much have you experienced of this? They all said, or the largest majority said, medium, medium, medium exposure. 70%, which is completely contradictory to the theory. Because we expect high levels, isn't it? Because that kind of f explains everything. All right, so there's the first bomb. Second one, this is the only one. This is the person horrification one, meaning seeing somebody else. Um, being, being exposed to violence or somebody that I care about and feeling helpless to help that person. This is the only one where we have a 41% um, high exposure. And then a minimum exposure on the other side, okay? Here's the violent coaching one. Once again, minimum or medium, sorry, exposure, um, where we have 43% um, um, saying that it's only medium exposure to violent coaching that my father or, or significant others does do not use violent coaching to teach me how to deal with social problems and that. But significant is 25% of the cases it does happen. So the question is, what is the long-term result of this? So defiance, this is where the child decides, okay, I've had enough, um, I am actually going to stop this and I am going to become the person that's been abusing me over time, right? Once again, medium exposure with a 27% maximum exposure. Then virulency, this is the interesting, remember I threw out the, the other one, violent performances, so this is the interesting one, um, where the child becomes notorious in his community. 65% of them said no, I am not notorious in my community.